Thanks very much, uh, Tim. It's good to see you again. And uh, thank you to Father Lopez for the invitation. And I also want to thank you for the efficacious prayer uh, that made me feel so welcome here by ensuring that the weather would not be in any way different from that that I've become accustomed to in South Bend <laughs> and make me not miss Washington too much. Well, uh, Paulo Carozza, my colleague who had to leave, unfortunately, uh, began by, uh, I think, expressing um, some humility about being a, uh, just a country lawyer uh, amid, amid so many sophisticated and smart people. I'm, clearly, this conference is on a path of dissent uh, because we go from a country lawyer now to a social scientist. Uh, so clearly, we're ending on a very low note. Uh, I actually want to spend a little bit of time talking about Dignitatis Humanae, which has been talked about a bit, but uh, in interesting ways we haven't really necessarily talked about a lot of the text itself. So I want to begin by pointing to a, a quote at the end of Dignitatis Humanae, in which the Declaration states, in some ways, that its guiding principle that, that guides both the document itself and the Church's broader thinking on religious liberty as a whole. And the quote reads, the freedom of the church is the fundamental principle in what concerns the relations between the church and governments and the whole civil order. This is the, the fundamental pr principle, the freedom of the church, not civil peace, not um, you know, um, uh, um, uh, uh, kind of Rawlsian, uh, um, uh, sim simply uh, being able to live uh, together a modus vivendi. While dignitatis humanae then represents, in some respects, what you could regard as a kind of change in policy in regards to the church's relations to the secular order, it does not represent a change in fundamental doctrine. As Thomas Pink, I think, has uh, argued rather persuasively in a recent article in the journal First Things, dignitatis humanae represents, a, in particular, a change in the church's thinking about the proper scope and role of the state as a partner in, as an enforcer of church doctrine, as well as, as its role in exercising, uh, and as uh, quoting Pink, its coercive power to restrict the public practice of and proselytization by false religions, including Protestantism, end quote. This change in policy was influenced not solely by the internal direction in church doctrine, but based, at least in significant part, with the experience of, uh, of, the, of the church with political developments, especially in the Western world, and in particular with the church's experience in the United States, and as guided especially by the special role played in the drafting of Dignitatis Humanae uh, by the American Jesuit John Courtney Murray. As Pink again, and to quote him, notes, even before the council, the mainstream of Catholic thinking increasingly saw the liberty of individual belief and practice as sacrosanct. Thus, experience with, liberal, uh, with modern liberalism had proved in the eyes of many, and in particular to, to Courtney Murray, that liberalism was good for the Catholic Church. This seemed especially to be the understanding, in particular, of the growing acceptance of Catholics in America that was marked at this period by the election of its first Catholic president, John F. Kennedy, just five years before the promulgation of Dignitatis Humanae. So if the experience of Catholics during the century of slow but growing acceptance in a liberal America and a Protestant America contributed and perhaps even contributed substantially to this change in the church's policy, if not its doctrine, then we might rightly ask today whether we can still share the confidence expressed in the declaration about the prospects for religious liberty within modern liberal democracies a mere half century after the promulgation of Dignitatis Humanae. For Dignitatis Humanae not only articulates in strong term the church's historic insistence upon the freedom of individuals to arrive at their religious beliefs or even non-belief or wrong belief, citing the example of Jesus' non-coercive call to faith. The declaration also confident, confidently articulates an expectation that even in the face of an increasingly dominant liberal order, that that order would not only or merely tolerate diverse forms of religious belief, but would also demonstrate a capacity for and a commitment to positive and supportive atmosphere toward religious belief, both out of a cognizance of the legitimacy of spiritual aspirations, as well as what it notes as the secondary and salutary benefits for the political order. And so the declaration states, and I quote, government is also Government is also to help create conditions favorable to the fostering of religious life, 
in order that people may be truly enabled to exercise their religious rights and to fulfill their religious duties, and also in order that society itself may profit by the moral qualities of justice and peace, which have their origins in men's faithfulness to God and his holy will." End quote. Throughout the text of Dignitatis Humanae, there is the justly celebrated recognition by the church fathers that the state has no particular facility or competence, as we just heard, uh, in the coercion of true religious belief, or even to, uh, in some ways a kind of knowledge of, of religion. For many of its readers, this is the most salient aspect of the Declaration, one that appears then to comport with the long-standing claims on the part of liberal philosophy of a neutrality or indifference toward the truth claims regarding the good, an indifference by liberal polities toward what John Rawls mentioned frequently here this weekend called comprehensive doctrines, including, of course, most prominently the contents of religious belief. However, perhaps less celebrated and noted by many is the, is the sustained insistence throughout the Declaration that the state and the citizenry as a whole cannot, in fact, be indifferent toward conceptions of the good. The Declaration insists that the defense of religious freedom be embraced as a concern that, and I quote, devolves upon the whole citizenry, upon social groups, upon government, and upon the church and other religious communities in virtue of the duty of all toward the common welfare. The ultimate source of this willingness to defend religious liberty derives not from a liberal indifference to matters of the good, but as the proper context for the uncoerced attainment of knowledge and worship of God. By extension, such a condition of uncoerced freedom of worship is also the precondition for the proper and true understanding of freedom. Not simply freedom to do as one likes in matters of religion or generally in one's comportment in the world, but the freedom to act and choose rightly and to choose well. If state coercion, coercion of belief is appropriately to be rejected, at the same time the church fathers, the authors of the document, also insist upon an embrace of what they call true freedom and a rejection of a false understanding of freedom, namely what they write is the tendency of humans who seem to inc be inclined to use the name of freedom as the pretext for refusing to submit to authority or for making light of the duty to obedience. The Declaration insists that it remains the task of those who are, quote, charged with educating others that they do their utmost to form men who will, on the one hand, will respect moral order and be obedient to lawful authority, and on the other, will be lovers of true freedom. Men, in other words, who will come to decisions on their own judgment and who, in the light of truth, govern their activities with a sense of responsibility and strive after what is true and right." End quote. As the Church Fathers conclude in this pivotal point of the Declaration, the ultimate grounds for the insistence upon and justification of religious liberty is not neutrality in the name of civic peace and toleration of diversity in support of a Rawlsian modus vivendi, but that it is the means to a more full, <coughs> conscious, and freely attained condition of self-rule. And I quote again, religious freedom therefore ought to have this further purpose and aim that men may come to act with greater responsibility in fulfilling their, duty, their duties in community life. While the Declaration insists that every person is in possession of civic liberty in regards to religious questions, even to the point of acknowledging that this freedom protects even those who, and I quote, do not live up to their obligation of seeking the truth. Nevertheless, the grounds for religious liberty is not based upon, quote, I quote again, the subjective disposition of the person, but rather a deeper commitment to the ultimate purpose or aim of liberty, which is, to, to cite again the document, true freedom. While a state cannot coerce belief, neither can it be indifferent to the ultimate basis and grounds of religious liberty, this true liberty that derives from religious belief. Two problems then arise practically from the Declaration's, it seems to me, appropriate articulation of the grounds and the norms of religious liberty. First, while theoretically and theologically the Declaration rightly concludes, and I quote, that a harmony exists between the freedom of the church and religious freedom 
which is to be recognized as the right of all men and, and communities sanctioned by constitutional law, end quote. This harmony can only exist when the liberal state and its citizenry acknowledge the ultimate source and grounds for the existence of religious liberty, namely that they agree in a preliminary way upon the nature of true freedom. Thus, liberty is preconditioned by an initial commitment to the substance of the church's understanding of liberty. While such an expectation might be valid in theory, nevertheless, we can see that politically and practically this has, has, is, and continues to be problematic. Indeed, to the extent that liberalism begins with a fundamentally different idea of liberty, as we have discussed at great length here this weekend, this theoretical harmony is likely to quickly dissolve in practice if it can be thought to have existed at all in the first place. And this, I think, was the, the point that Paulo Carozza was making with great force about once you get down to particulars, it's going to turn out that there's not a harmony there. The second problem that seems to me to arise from this articulation is that the Declaration can insists simultaneously upon two ways in which religious believers are to act in relationship to fellow citizens. First, it is insisted that there be studied avoidance of coercion in all forms. And I quote, in spreading religious faith and in introducing religious practices, everyone ought at all times to refrain in any manner of action which might seem to carry a hint of coercion. However, in the next paragraph, it is also insisted, quote, that it comes within the meaning of religious freedom that religious communities should not be prohibited from freely undertaking to show the special value of their doctrine in what concerns the organization of society and the inspiration for the whole of human activity. Given that this, do this document was promulgated at a, at a time when the existence of liberal constitutional democracies was becoming the international norm, these twin statements juxtaposed within sentences of each, of each other obscure the manner by which the special value of religious belief is to be translated into the public sphere. If lawmaking in a liberal democracy is at least a, in part, if not a substantial part, the reflection of the beliefs and values of the citizenry, then inevitably such laws might come to reflect religious belief or aspects of religious belief. How can then this be squared with a statement that even the hint of coercion is to be av avoided in as much as laws always, avoid, always involve coercion? How can faithful believers who live in a liberal democracy not only express their beliefs, but express them in ways within the context of a liberal democracy that avoids even the hint of coercion without compromising the ways that their belief ultimately demands shared recognition of the nature of true freedom? Is it not reasonable to expect the widespread embrace of a shared understanding of true freedom and government's role in fostering conditions favorable to religious life will not involve more than a hint of coercion in the form of law and public policy. Recall when this was written, uh, when, when this was promulgated, that there were still laws on the books banning the sale of contraception and that these laws existed uh, and were deemed to be constitutional until 1965 in the case of Griswold versus Connecticut and then 1972 with Eisenstadt versus Baird. And that these were not seen as expressly Catholic teachings, but it was believed in a widespread manner that the state had a compelling interest in regulating sexual activity. Dignitatis Humanae then reflected a great confidence in the capacities of liberal democracy, not only to accommodate, but robustly to support the basic commitments of religion generally, and Catholic faith in particular. On the other hand, it seemed also to believe that public commitment to true freedom could be maintained without a hint of coercion, that the laws could be articulated in such a way that it would avoid any appearance of sectarianism, and yet that the polity would nevertheless profit from the moral qualities of justice and peace which have men's origin, uh, have their origin in men's faithfulness to God. These are all quotes from Humanae Vitae. While theoretically plausible then, as a matter of practice, and after a half century's experience, we now see more clearly that these tensions have been resolved, but they have been resolved in a way that perhaps was unanticipated by the church fathers. If not unanticipated, then certainly unhoped for. <clears throat> 
and I believe does and should require further development on the church's thinking on the relationship between the church and the liberal state, and part of what this conference is really about. This does not require, then, a basic or fundamental rethinking of the basic principles of dignitatis humanae, certainly not its fundamental articulation of support of religious liberty, which I believe most of us would here see as sound. However, it may require further thought about the prudential consideration, and in particular, the under-articulated uh, way in which it is expected that the state can be expected to foster conditions favorable to religious life, and particularly the assumption that there would be a widespread or could be a widespread shared embrace of the belief in true freedom. The fact that the liberal conception of freedom tends to undermine this basic requirement, this expectation of the very possibility then of religious liberty itself, in a way that was said far more sophisticated by uh, uh, Dr. Schindler, suggests that further development is needed uh, uh, and thought about the way that the state can and should encourage religious belief. Now, there's a long tradition among political theorists and legal scholars who insist that liberalism is defined above all by a neutrality regarding conceptions of the good. But many thinkers, both critics of liberalism, many here t this weekend, as well as many of its most enthusiastic proponents, have insisted that liberalism itself embraces and promotes a deeply held set of substantive commitments. These commitments arise from liberalism's deeper commitment to a conception of individual liberty. Again, I repeat what has been said here before, uh, the liberty to believe, act, or choose as one wishes uh, in, in the manner which Thomas Hobbes described, where the law is silent. However, the, the liberal political theorist, I want to use uh, one, one example, not calling from this rich tradition of the communio analysis of liberalism, but from a liberal voice uh, from deep within the liberal tradition, uh, my former colleague Stephen Macedo at Princeton University, who has forcefully and admirably written that liberal commitment to this form of freedom does not finally take the form of neutrality, but rather an active and quite conscious effort to build a society and to shape a culture that ultimately shapes the soul of man under liberalism. In a 1998 article entitled Transformative Constitutionalism and the Case of Religion, Defending the Moderate Hegemony of Liberalism, Macedo has argued that liberal constitutionalism is and rightly should be, and I quote, a pervasively educational order. My friend Chad Pecknold, who was here yesterday, talked about the catechesis of liberalism. Among the shaping powers that it does and should employ, according to Macedo, is the effort to diminish or weaken or attenuate and even reduce, if not outright eliminate, non-liberal groups and belief within the liberal order. At a most basic level, he argues, liberal law and practice, and I quote, aims to shape people to help ensure that freedom is what they want. That is, far from being neutral or indifferent about whether liberal freedom is or is not the proper way to understand and to animate human life and choices, Macedo argues that a liberal order appropriately and actively seeks to make men free in accordance with that liberal understanding of freedom. To do this, it must not only order the public realm in accordance to full access to liberal rights to free and unencumbered choice, it must, he writes also, and I quote, constitute the private realm in its own interest. Of central concern, then, is an area that many regard liberals, liberalism's attitude to be that of indifferent toleration, religious belief. Macedo argues that liberalism can ill afford to leave this vital area untouched by liberalism's soul-shaping and comprehensively educative efforts and points in particular in his article to the, to the success that liberalism has had in recasting Catholicism in its own image. Macedo points, among other pieces of positive evidence, to, the, and I quote again, the ritual in which Catholic judges and politicians uh, and candidates for president have had to pass through in their quest for higher office. Approvingly citing the scholar Sanford Levinson, he notes that Catholics have effectively been forced to proclaim the practical meaningless of their religious convictions as a condition of being allowed to serve. This is what I believe in private, but of course has no bearing on my role as a public servant. Macedo rightly suggests 
that such rituals are bound to be educative, that they have a shaping power for society as a whole. In particular, Catholics and people of perhaps similar belief are effectively disallowed through disapproval, dismissiveness, uh, and even outright uh, um, uh, mocking from a robust opportunity to express the substance of Catholic teachings or even to receive a receptive hearing by the order shaped by these deepest assumptions of liberalism. To the extent that Catholicism is intention or even outright criticism of the liberal conception of freedom and the basic anthropological assumption of radical autonomy on which it is based, Catholicism stands as a competitor that must be effectively silenced. Public claims of the, of the validity of its beliefs, if not legally disallowed, they are practically disallowed and can only be retained, at least in theory, as forms of private belief. And thus, as Macedo argues, and I quote, the healthy course of things in a healthy, democracy, healthy liberal democracy will be that belief's intention with fundamental liberal democratic commitments will be diminished in importance. Moreover, such belief finally can't simply retreat to the, pup, to the private realm, because this too must be the subject of the shaping of the human soul. For example, Macedo argues that liberalism cannot be indifferent to the education of children, that it has a civic interest in the shaping of properly liberal souls, ones that will ensure that, as I previously quoted, freedom is what they want. Thus, and I quote, if parents want their children always to be guided solely by sectarian religious teachings, that would be bad, both in politics and elsewhere, then their view of good citizenship is at odds with the liberal one. We have good reasons to hope that there will be fewer families raising such children in the future, end quote. Far from offering then a neutral or level playing field, Macedo acknowledges that liberalism actively seeks to advance a view of freedom that is fundamentally distinct from and hostile to that view of true freedom, a freedom in conformity to a given truth as is articulated in Dignitatis Humanae. With refreshing honesty, Macedo acknowledges that liberalism seeks to be a hegemony, fostering, among other things, a certain religious homogeneity. And that's a quote that finally accords with a definition of freedom that is at the heart of liberalism. Liberalism's critics as well have noted this substantive commitment to a particular definition of liberty advanced by liberalism. You've heard a lot of these, so I don't have to review these, um, but I'll just quote one authority named David L. Schindler, uh, who, has who has developed this theory at great depth, or, uh, uh, developed this insight with great depth, who has noted that worldviews that favor silence about God in the affairs of the earthly or temporal order therefore always retain an official and public theoretical advantage over worldviews that favor speech about God. Now, nearly 30 years ago, Emeritus Professor of Theology here at CUA, Joseph Komanchek, wrote in an article that he, like John Courtney Murray, believed at Vatican II and with the promulgation of Dignitatis Humanae, that a distinction could be sustained between what, and I quote, between liberal political structures, which the church can accept, and a liberal ideology, which it must repudiate. Indeed, it could be argued that the confidence expressed in Dignitatis Humanae over the capacity and willing of liberal constitutional governments, as well as the broader society that it shapes, to create conditions favorable to the fostering of religious life hinges on the validity of this distinction between a liberal political order and a liberal ideology. That is, the church fathers appeared to accept this distinction, that one that's made in part by John Courtney Murray, that liberalism, while itself indifferent to conceptions of the good, would nevertheless provide a sphere of free exercise in which religious belief could flourish. And among other things, as stated in Dignitatis Humanae, that society itself would profit by the moral qualities of justice and peace, which have their origins in men's faithfulness to God and his holy will. Murray himself believed that this, that this provision of, of, of this space was itself tantamount to the belief of providing the sphere of free exercise, that it needed nothing more. And so he was personally puzzled 
why it would make sense to promote religious, for the government to promote religious belief, that all it needed to do was provide the space for religious belief. In fact, he said, and I quote, why would government need to promote an immunity? How would somebody become more and more immune? It was simply enough to provide the space. Murray assumed that the non-liberal, that a non-liberal ideology could flourish within the context of liberal political structures. That confidence, and I think we've heard a lot about this this weekend, is rightly shaken today and appears to be increasingly implausible. The hegemony of liberalism, if moderate in the words of Stephen Macedo, nevertheless daily comes more into view as an inexorable ideology of modern society. Now at this conference, and I, I suspect its inspiration, comes out of the recent uh, HHS mandate as the primary example of the aggressiveness of this liberal order and ideology in our time. And while I agree with this assessment, it seems to me that we may have a tendency to concentrate on this instance at, uh, and, and even to the point of ignoring the ways that the, the, the soul-shaping order of, of the liberal ideology is in many ways more insidious than even this more obvious example of an encroachment of the state into the lives of the church, the life of the church. And none of these, to point to Macedo's own example, is more critical than the education of the young. That is an issue that goes to the very heart of the very formation of the human person. One of the main articulations of religious liberty in Dignitatis Humanae concerns the rights of parents to educate their children in a manner that they see fit. As is stated at the very, toward the very beginning of, of the Declaration, section five, and I quote, the family, since it is a society in its own original right, has the right freely to live its own domestic religious life under the guidance of parents. Parents, moreover, must have the right to determine in accordance with their own religious education uh, their own religious education beliefs, the kind of religious education that their children are to receive. Government, in consequence, must acknowledge the right of parents to make a genuinely free choice of schools and other means to education, end quote. And here the Declaration confidently expresses that the formal juridical right of parental choice and education will be a sufficient means by which the content of the faith can be passed along. Yet does this formal juridical right, in fact, suffice? We are thankfully not yet in the situation which was described yesterday by Bishop Lafitte, in which apparently the, it was in France, the secretary of their minister of education declared his joy that children over the age of two right, uh, should, be, uh, uh, should be in some ways uh, uh, indoctrinated, uh, removed from their, from their families. Uh, we are thankfully not in that condition uh, in, which, uh, uh, in which our formal juridical right to parental education has not been encroached upon. But nevertheless, I think we need to at least point to a trove of recent social science data that suggests that liberal society in itself is a much more pervasive and powerful educator of the young today than the family or the church. The generation that came of age at the time of the promulgation of Vatican II, namely the baby boomers, ended up leaving the religion of their upbringing by nearly two-thirds, according to Clark Roof in his book, Spiritual Marketplace, although the, uh, uh, above 90% of them grew up in households of one denomination. If most of them ended up in a different religious faith, that likelihood can no longer be taken for granted, that they'll even end up in a religious faith. Today, roughly 20% of American adults self-identify as none, and that's N-O-N-E, uh, <laughs> as their religion, in spite of 80% of those having been raised in religious households, according to a Pew report released in 2012. That number was 5 to 7% a generation ago, and even as recently as 2007, stood at 16%. So we've seen an increase of 25% in simply five years of an increase in the number of nuns. <laughs> Non-belief in particular is epidemic among the young. According to my colleague David Campbell, along with Robert Putnam in their book American Grace, fully a third of whom today categorize themselves as nuns. And with recent polls showing that 60, per, uh, I'm sorry, the Catholic Church has lost most members in, in sheer numbers through attrition to the nuns, 
with recent polls showing that about 60% of children raised as Catholics will, as adult, remain in the faith. That means those of you young people who are still thinking about raising families, you're getting close to about breaking even if you want to raise your children as Catholics. We're barely above the break-even point of, of, of being able to educate the young in the faith. Dignitatis Humanae states that the rights of parents are violated if their children are forced to attend lessons or instructions which are not in agreement with their religious beliefs. Given the evidence of the epidemic inability of families and religions to pass along their faith to their children, might we rightly ask what in fact constitutes a condition of being forced? In the formal juridical model, the absence of constraint constitutes the presence of freedom. However, what, what if that very understanding itself that very understanding of freedom constitutes the ground condition, to quote from an earlier paper, by which our young are educated today. What if that is the deepest lesson that is conveyed in our society, that the absence of constraint constitutes the condition of freedom? If so, then to live in American society today is a sense to be in a condition in which if one holds a view of human freedom that contradicts this view, one in fact exists in a pervasive educational system in which children are constantly learning and I quote again from the Humanae Vitae, lessons and instructions which are not in agreement with their religious beliefs. Today, to live in America is in a sense increasingly to be forced, to use Macedo's words, to be shaped, to believe that freedom is what we want. Freedom understood as the unconstrained choice and absence of constraint. That choice that increasingly faces parents who wish to educate their children in a religious tradition is to withdraw from the society as much as possible. But this contradicts, as was articulated yesterday by Father Lopez, a central belief in the Catholic tradition that culture is and ought to be formative and reinforcing in the formation of the human person. Now the rest of my paper is a suggestion for how we should reshape the political order so that it will in fact promote religious belief, but I'm out of time. <laughs> So I'll have to leave that for another time. If you want to invite me back, Father, I'll be happy to, <laughs> to discuss that. Thank you very much. Thank you.